I'm Dr. Carl Hasselman. Uh, we're going to be talking today about the unfusion technique. Uh, basically, the concept of taking a fusion, although well done, um, or even a non-union that's painful, uh, and converting it to a hemiarthroplasty. Uh, I've done this in approximately uh, 12 patients now successfully, uh, a couple times for a painful non-union, uh, but most of the time it's for a perfectly well done fusion but with the type of shoe style or activity that they want to do, um, they still have pain. Um, so this is just one of those examples and we're going to go through the whole technique. So today we have a middle-aged female who previously had a fusion, uh, well done fusion approximately five years ago. Um, she, uh, after that, had pain more in the interphalangeal joint of the great toe, secondary to stressing. She, she couldn't wear the shoes she wanted to wear when she did she would have more pain um, in the um, interphalangeal joint with toe off. Um, and actually her x-rays, uh, if you look at her x-rays, you can see that she had a standard technique with one cross screw. There are uh, a plate and screws uh, over top of the joint. The joint itself actually has a, a very uh, nice alignment to it. Um, uh, on the lateral film, you can see that there's a slight, even a flexion built into the proximal phalanx in an attempt to uh, help her wear slightly higher shoes and help her with roll off. However, even though it's a very solid fusion, very well done fusion, she has significant pain at the interphalangeal joint when she goes to walk. And so she's very unhappy with this and we're gonna convert this over to a uh, hemiarthroplasty now. So you can see that uh, she's had uh, some foot surgery done before. She had a little bit of work on her second toe but you can see that she actually has the fusion, the incisions well healed. Uh, if you actually look, it seems to be relatively well aligned, um, the foot itself. Um, what we're gonna do is basically first get down to the uh, joint, uh, and get to the fusion site, um, and uh, uh, once we get down there, then we'll be able to make our decisions as to where we wanna cut. Um, so um, actually I can just use her old incision uh, for a uh, thing, knife, thank you. Um, so we're just gonna make, rotate this one. We're just gonna make an incision. I'm literally just gonna take out her old scar. Um, she formed uh, a slight keloid uh, from her previous incision. Uh, I know that I'll have a little extra uh, room to play because when we take out the plate and screws, she'll have a little extra room so I can be a little um, bit more uh, generous with the amount of skin I can take off of this area. And again, I'm just doing this. I wouldn't normally do this, but she, her, she did form a keloid, and she asked that we try to revise this scar while we're in there. So uh, normally it would just be a standard going through the old incision. Okay, so once we, now we have our um, exposure just through the skin. Uh, the next thing you wanna do is dissect down just into this area. Uh, you know your extensor tendon is going to be in this area. You, you, you want to obviously save it. Very few people actually cut the extensor tendon um, uh, when uh, they uh, do this, uh, the fusion. Obviously, if, if, if you know that the extensor tendon has been cut, I wouldn't recommend this operation uh, because they're going to have uh, no ability to extend. But after getting through all that scar, you can see there's a nice white, shiny extensor tendon sitting in its sheath. Uh, quite happily. So what I can do is actually now I know where the sh uh, extensor tendon is, I can just come to the actually medial edge of it and that will allow me to get him up or her out of the way so that we can now expose the joint. So I'm literally extensor tendon, I'm going to put it up here, I'm just going to get a little bit more here and then uh, Lauren, my PA is going to put in a, a self retractor just to protect the extensor tendon so that we can finish doing our dissection. And so I'm dissecting down onto the plate now. I actually have the plate um, exposed. We have to take obviously the scar tissue off the top of it. This is just would be standard anytime. Uh, it would be a lot nicer if she didn't have a plate uh, technique done, but it, it, wouldn't, it still won't uh, interfere with what I'm gonna do. It's just a little bit more time consuming obviously to get the plate and the screw out. But one of the things I've done is prior to the uh, surgery, I actually looked at her x-rays and I saw that uh, the fusion 
of her joint and where I thought the old joint line was was between the second and third screws on the plate. So it's just kind of a nice landmark for me to get started. So I'm going to keep that in my head that somewhere between the second and third would be a nice place to make my cut. Um, uh, we typically will do it more under a fluoroscopic uh, guidance. Basically, um, you, you want to, when you make your cut, you're just basically going to make a perfectly transverse uh, uh, osteotomy uh, trying to go through the fusion site. When you make your osteotomy, it's going to be a perfectly transverse osteotomy. And you, you, you're, you're keeping in mind that you're going to be adding on a hemicap, so you're going to be recreating a metatarsal head. So you don't want to cut long on the metatarsal and short on the phalanx, you'd actually like to try to cut right through where the metatarsal head yeah. used to be um, or slightly proximal to that area, keeping in mind that when you put in your new implant, when you put your implant in, you're going to be extending the length a little bit. So now basically we've already taken the, the screw, the cross screw uh, out, uh, it was up in here. But before I take this plate out, like I said, we're going to go one, two, three, somewhere around the third um, uh, screw hole was about where I would assume the joint is. So I'm going to just mark that with a little marker, and now we're going to get the plate off. And so basically just try to get that. Roger. But with the plate out, um, now at least I have a general idea where I want to go. So what I'm going to do now is to, before I make this osteotomy cut, what I'll do is I'm actually going to mark it with uh, um, just with my osteotome, and I'll hold it there, and we're going to bring the C-arm in and take a quick picture to make sure that this is exactly where I want to place my osteotomy. So, so what we've done is basically we've taken our hardware out, and now we have our, our fusion site. And what I'm doing is I actually just took an osteotome and marked along. And it actually actually turned out that it was right where we had marked it with the uh, uh, purple pen. Uh, because the, the place I'm choosing is, is, is you, this is where you have to have a little imagination and say, if, what would her toe look like prior to being fused? And, and I'm looking, and here's her sesamoid bones right here. You know that in most standard metatarsals, uh, the, the metatarsal head is slightly distal to the sesamoids. The sesamoids sitting right underneath the grooves in the crista. And so um, I see my, the tip of my, uh, the distal uh, portion of my sesamoid is here, and then my osteotome is just slightly past that. You would argue that, well, the metatarsal head would probably be even slightly further than that. But you've got to remember, I've got to put an implant on here to recreate the metatarsal head, so I have to take that into consideration. I'm usually going to add on uh, uh, maybe uh, two or three millimeters when I put that head, that new uh, uh, head on. So what I'm going to do is even, uh, so I actually, even though my mark is here, I know when my implant's on, it'll be about here. Which actually, if you have a good imagination, you can see the phalanx coming down and across, and you would say right about there would be where her old phalanx was. And this space between the two is actually where we're going to put our metatarsal head. I still want to pull the soft tissues off both sides. You can imagine because it's fused, this hasn't moved in a long time. So I do a pretty aggressive uh, subperiosteal. I'm right on the periosteum um, of the uh, bone all the way around the fusion. Basically, peeling all the soft tissues off that I can for now. We can come back later and do more stripping, but I just want to make sure that I've got both sides. I'm just turning the heel this way a little bit. That's good, just a bit long. So you can see. And you'll see that on the other side, I'm doing the same thing. I'm just staying on my bone. I'm not coming off the bone, but I'm just kind of peeling the soft tissues off uh, around the bone itself. And so once I have that exposed now and released most of it, I'm going to go ahead and do my uh, osteotomy. So um, uh, Lori's going to put a couple of Holman retractors, obviously around, to protect the soft tissues from the saw. And I have my mark where I'd like to be. And that's where I'm going to decide. This is probably the most important part, because if you put this too far or too proximal, uh, or too distal or too proximal, you're obviously going to alter the normal joint alignment. And 
you, if you make it too short, you'll have transfer metatarsalgia. If you make it too long, obviously, then your soft tissues aren't going to allow you to have any motion. So you kind of have to really recreate what uh, she had prior to the fusion. So with that said, um, and it's marked, um, we're going to go ahead and do our osteotomy. And again, I'm going perfectly transverse, uh, perpendicular, 90 degrees to the shaft of the metatarsal. And you have to think about it in both directions. Not only do you have to be transverse this way, but you don't want to be angled this way or this way. You actually have to be thinking through uh, three planes. As I'm doing this, I'm careful to feel because I obviously don't want to go cutting too far down um, and do a lot of damage to the flexors underneath. Um, but I, I uh, but at the same time, I have to release all this. Now that I've released all that area, I can actually start to work with this slightly to get some motion back. Sometimes if I'm really tight or I don't think I'm going to get what I want, I'll take a small wedge uh, uh, off the proximal phalanx, but most of the time I try to leave it untouched for now because down the road um, uh, I can use the reamer, and we'll go through that technique, to shorten up the, uh, the uh, phalanx if I have to. So with it exposed like this, what we're going to do is try to work our way around it, and I'm going to take my gouge, and I'm going to get under the metatarsal head and try to get, obviously, the scarred and plantar tissues out of there. And trying to be careful, obviously, because you don't want to really tear up the sesamoids. Uh, if the sesamoids are involved in the fusion, then this technique cannot be done. At least I've not done it, and I, I wouldn't recommend it because that doesn't make sense if your sesamoids are scarred in. Now, in this patient, the sesamoids were not scarred in and, and not involved in the fusion, and therefore, I think that's why she's a good candidate. But all I'm doing is peeling soft tissues off the plantar surface, trying to go basically between the plantar plate and the, or the sesamoids and the plantar surface of the metatarsal head. And in doing so, we basically are freeing up all the scarred in uh, remnants of what she had. Now you'll notice that I'm kind of going all the way around. And remember, People are worried about having uh, avascular necrosis, but the truth is, is if you do this technique, as long as you don't cut the metatarsal shaft, you can actually strip quite a bit of the metatarsal safely without getting avascular necrosis because there is an intraosseous blood supply here. At this point, I now have my osteotomy. I now have my freed up, and actually I can see my sesamoids underneath, and we'll show you them a little bit later, but my retractor's holding them. Once I get to this point, then at this point, I'm going to start putting in my hemicap uh, because I'm going to basically recreate her metatarsal head. And so I'm going to put the guide on just pre thinking if I had to give her a new metatarsal head, how would I do that? Obviously, I'm going to make it so that I'm flush with the plantar surface, because you can see here's groove one and here's groove two, where the uh, sesamoids used to, or still do articulate. Um, what I'm gonna do is say, I wanna make sure that no matter what I do, I'm flush with my handicap down there, because I absolutely do not want it to stick below that. And at the same time, I'm going to change, okay, once I get it, I get basically make sure that my plantar position of this is f perfect. Then I'm going to go up against the bone. Once I've done that, then your system that should help you make sure I'm going to make sure I'm going down the shaft of the metatarsal. And you can see Lori's pushing my hand over because she's watching the other direction, uh, medial to lateral, and making sure that I'm down the shaft. So basically, remember the head is at the end of the shaft, and so you want your guide wire to go down the shaft. And in doing that, the theory is now, when I put the new hemicap on, it's going to sit right there. And it's going to be flush up against my implant. 
So, the first thing we're going to do is drill. Now, your, your post obviously is not going to be completely flush with that. Um, uh, you actually have to pretend at this point that you're doing the typical hemicap technique. And you're going to drill in, but you know that when in the hemicap technique, this part of the drill bit is flush with the metatarsal head. So I'm pretending that there's a metatarsal head in here, and I'm saying, if I was going to go in with my drill, and there was a metatarsal head there, it would be right about here. And so I'm just saying, I would have, remember the head, you can assume it's, it's, it's going to be rounded uh, in this position. And, and actually, if we can look at a lateral view here, um, you can see that if, uh, if I was going to uh, guess where the tip of the metatarsal head would be, I would know that it has a slight curvature, superior to inferior, and that's about where I want the end of my metatarsal head to be. And that's not a bad position right about there. If you felt like you needed to go in a little bit deeper to decompress it, that's fine. But I, I would strongly say don't put it in too far. You're going to make your metatarsal head much shorter. A nice technique is you want to obviously put your guide wire right back in where it was so you don't have any problems. Now, once we have it where we want, we're going to put our uh, tap. We obviously have to tap what we drilled. Again, we're going to use a black line. I'm just pretending that I know her metatarsal head, the tip of her metatarsal head would typically be about three to four millimeters past where I made my osteotomy site. I'll hold that. I'll hold it through a rotate okay. But you'll notice that it's, it's going to be hard. It's going to be hard bone, so because it's an old fusion, it's not going to be the soft bone like a hemicap. But you'll notice as I'm tapping, I'm just tapping it in. And you'll notice again, when my black laser line, which is right here, is just about three or four millimeters past uh, my osteotomy site. And, and I'm basically just saying that's where I want my metatarsal head to end. And that's not a bad position. So once I do that, I'm going to take this off. We then... Now at this point, this is going to be your tapered post. This is going to be extremely important because this is going to go in and basically seat for the, the, the distance where the hemicap is actually going to finally sit. So we're basically going to slide it on and we're going to put our tapered post in. And as I go in, I'm doing the same thing. I'm actually saying to myself, where is that post going to, where's the tip of my head going to be? Because that black line is where the head of the metatarsal is going to sit. Now, and so again, I'm going to be just about three to four millimeters past my osteotomy site. Once we're here, the next part of the hemicap technique would actually be to measure. The trouble is, is they really can't do much measuring here. So typically, I'll just try to figure out which one I want to do. Do I want a slightly more curvature or slightly less curvature? And, and in, my, in my experience has been, I'd like to do a slightly more curvature because I think that works the best in terms of giving you a new uh, shape to the metatarsal head. We want to pull the phalanx out of the way. Start this reamer off the bone. All I'm going to do is slowly go down onto her metatarsal head. And remember, the tapered post will stop me. It will tell me that's all the further I can go. And, and so now we basically have reamed to start creating our new metatarsal head. So I take this off and we just suck out all that uh, extra garbage that's in there. And then we have to take the second uh, reamer, uh, four or five reamer, uh, which would be the four or five, the matching four or five uh, DF component. Once I've uh, uh, gotten this point, now here's where it comes tricky. You kind of have to figure out, okay, well, which way do you want a toe to bend? Because remember how you place the hemicap is going to determine partially how it goes. If you look at the bottom of her phalanx, you can see that here would be groove one 
for the metatarsal. This would be kind of where the crista belongs, and this would be where the second, uh, the medial sesamoid will go. So you think about this. This is the 6 o'clock position. I want to go to the 12 o'clock position because obviously the cristae would be the most plantar position of the metatarsal, and I'm going to go this way. So I'm going to use that crista as the guide for where I actually want to put my reamer. And so I'm basically looking at this, and I want to point in that same exact direction. And all I'm going to do is just take off that top uh, portion. And again, the reamer will stop you so that you can't go any further than that. Now, once we've done this part, we're going to go ahead and wash it out pretty good. At this point, we have it pretty well set up, and I'm pretty happy with how it looks. And all I'm going to do now is put my hemi cap on. You obviously don't want to drop the cap. Um, and so this is a nice device that you can actually attach the red suction tubing to. And then you cut your sucker uh, suction hose, and you attach it. And now you have suction coming here. And so what you can do is take the hemi cap, and you know it has to go, uh, the, the flange, the dorsal flange is on the top. And this is just a nice way to hold it. And so all I'm gonna do is put it right about where I want it to be. And it should kind of match my old reaming. No, I'm gonna take this for a second more, because I need it. And once I'm kind of happy where the position is, and I push it on, then we can break the suction off. Okay. And then we take our impactor, our egg impactor, and a mallet. And this is going to be the final seating of the implant. Good. So now when I look at my implant and I look at my projection, um, I have some extra bone around the implant. Now you could put a trial implant in and, and to get rid of the uh, excess bone. But in this case, um, but in this case, I'm just going to use the saw to take this extra bone because I want to get rid of this excess bone on the median lateral sides. I only want my uh, hemicap articular surface. I leave the plantar surface alone because obviously that's where the um, sesamoids are going to articulate when we're done. So what we're doing basically is I'm going to just take the most medial extra bone off. I'm going to take a little bit of this edge right here. Okay. And then with her Lori protecting my uh, extensor tendon, I'm going to just do the same thing to the lateral side. Again, just getting that, any extra bone that's around here so that now nothing, bonjour, nothing but the hemicap is out at the end. And first thing I'm going to do is just kind of look, okay, I mean, believe it or not, she already has some decent motion, but I know I, I'm not going to leave the, this surface flat like this. And that's the nice thing about the second part of this. What we're going to do is self retainer, please, is now what we're going to do is, is Lori and I are going to work on getting some of the plantar structures released. And what I'm going to do is really try to do a subperiosteal dissection. And so I'm just taking my knife and I'm kind of working it around as I go around. Yeah, another really neat trick that I'll do is I'll take my curved gouge. I'll take a um, something to lay over or just to protect to cushion my, obviously my implant, I don't want to be scraping up my implant a whole bunch. And then pop this around the phalanx. And in doing so, I can actually force the phalanx out from behind where it is. The other nice thing about doing that is when I do that, I can actually work it. And I'll try to get this a little bit freer quicker so you can appreciate this. But with holding this right like this, now you can see here's the plantar surface of my proximal phalanx. 
And now I'm going to take a knife and literally just cut the whole plantar portion. But remember, I'm staying on the bone. The idea is, is I want the flexors to scar back down, but slightly longer, almost like if you were doing a hamstring release when you're doing a very contracted total knee. Um, it's the same principle. We want the, the, the tendon to actually scar back down. And I've actually done brevis releases even on primary hemicaps. And I have not had uh, problems with elevatus um, or even ele elevated toes or claw toes, and I've not seen that. And again, all I'm doing is, so you can understand if you can't see it very well, is I'm just working my knife around the, the area. So now that I've got a nice brevis release like this, I'm holding my phalanx out. Now what I want to do is I want to give myself a new metatarsal, uh, a new phalangeal base. Yeah. And so um, the first thing I'm gonna do is put the guide wire down. And I kind of want to think, because remember, you're now going to create a convex surface for the phalangeal side to match your concave surface of your hemicap. But I, I obviously, I don't want to um, put it, if this is my convex surface, obviously if I do it this way, the toe is gonna wanna be plantar flex more. If I do it this way, the toe is gonna wanna sit up in the air. So you really wanna be perpendicular to your shaft of your phalanx, which just the way uh, um, the great creator made us. And we're just trying to recreate that anatomy the best we can. So we're gonna put the um, guide wire in, and I am not really looking at my osteotomy at all. What I'm doing is I'm looking at my phalanx shaft, and I'm making sure that I'm gonna go basically in a perfectly nice shape down the shaft so that my guide wire is now my shaft and when I look from the AP direction I'm sitting quite nicely and when I look from a lateral direction I'm sitting right down the shaft of the proximal phalanx. If I'm down the shaft of the proximal phalanx and I'm in the central portion of it when I put my reamer on it, it has to be perpendicular to the uh, shaft of the metatarsal. Now you'll notice this reamer has a shape to it. It actually sh tries to recreate the proximal phalanx uh, base, but it'll also match your hemicap surface. So with our guide wire in place, we're basically gonna now take this, put it down on here, and ream. And this is where you can actually do a lot of different things. You can ream it. You definitely wanna at least create a surface. You don't want a perfectly flat surface, I don't think, um, but you want to create it. If you want to, and you want it to shorten her toe a little bit, um, you could take a little bit more. Personally, I like to stay in this really hard bone. I don't like to get any further because if you do, you get into really soft uh, bone. All I want to do is recreate a surface that is more concave. I take my wire out. Actually, you can come out of that, lawyer. We're good now. Thank you. Um, we're going to take this. Now, you'll notice I, the reamer did not cover the entire shaft, Ronjour. All I'm going to do is take this little bit of the edge of the bone, the rim around it, um, because I don't, there's no need for it. All you want is a, a little bit of a, a convex surface here, and the other stuff's just not doing you any favors. Okay, so now I'm just going to check. And when I take her out and I've released all my capsule, I want to make sure that my toe is going to come up. You see how high her second toe comes up? I want to make sure my big toe is going to come up the same height. And that's actually, with her, I want to put her up ankle in neutral or 90 degrees. I'm holding with my fist as if I'm simulating weight bearing. I will pull up on her second toe and her big toe. And her big toe had better come up as high as her second toe with the ankle at 90 and me simulating weight bearing. Because if you can do that easily and get that much motion, then I guarantee you this will work very well. Now, I've never done it. I suppose you could just leave hard bone up against the metal. I mean, that's the kind of concept uh, of uh, when you do a, a hemi-arthroplasty for the shoulder. But I, I just don't feel comfortable with that yet, um, and I haven't given it a try. So what a lot, a lot of times I'll do is I'm going to put just a little bit of a surface on the phalangeal base. Um, uh, you can use, uh, if, if sometimes if I have extra dorsal uh, capsule, I'll cut a square of that out to match the shape and just put the dorsal capsule here. 
Uh, obviously, in this case, she's actually had two previous surgeries. The second one was the fusion. Um, that um, uh, she's not going to have any soft tissue there. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually just take a piece of uh, collagen. Uh, uh, in this case, it's a bovine uh, xenograft uh, collagen tissue. Um, and, and I'll actually, it really doesn't matter. I don't think that one company's better than the other in terms of which one you want to use. Um, that's up for argument. What I'm going to do is see if I can fold it over three times like that and then lay it down, is it going to cover? And actually that will, that'll cover quite nicely right there. It'll just cover the surface of my head. So knowing that, I can actually take scissors now and I'll tell you, save this piece for a second and I'll show you why in a second. Okay, when I, when I, um, what I want to do is actually um, put that kind of so it'll match the shape. And you can trim this off later. That's not a big deal right now. Now, so I know that that's going to be my graft when I'm done. And I'll just lay that here for a second because we have to put some suture anchors in. Um, so the next thing we're going to do is we obviously have to hold the graft on. Now, some people actually create two bone tunnels. I'm sorry. Uh, some people will actually create bone tunnels. Um, uh, but in my case, uh, I actually just like to use suture anchors. And so all I'm going to do is I'm going to put one on this side and one on this side. And then Lori's going to put them in. We'll hammer them down. Get them to sit. And then we'll hold, literally, I'll hold it. And, and Lori will just put the sutures right through all three of them. All three layers. Um, but I, I just feel more comfortable instead of having the raw bone uh, up against my uh, implant, having this up against the implant. What I want to do is reduce my toe. So I'm going to push so that I don't disrupt my graft. So um, essentially, you can see the extensor tendons right where it's supposed to be. You'll notice that when I push up like she's simulating weight bearing, the toe goes to a nice straight position. Um, and it's, it's, it's plantigrade, it will touch the ground. The extensor tendon hasn't been damaged, it's intact. And at the same time, as she comes up, she will dorsiflex right up. You can see my graft pick up. We've basically recreated a joint. We have our uh, hemicap, resurfacing metatarsal head, we have our implant and then we have our proximal phalanx. So literally, it will move up and down. Now, at this part, of the, uh, one of the last parts of the procedure is I will look underneath at my sesamoids because I want to see how badly damaged they are. If I look under there and, um, you know what, maybe give me a lamina spreader uh, without. If I can get this in, and this is, I would never put this in here except for educational. Now, if you could see under here, uh, and I'll, I'll try to rotate a little bit better so you can see it, but here is actually one of the two sesamoids. This is actually going to be the lateral sesamoid. Here is actually the medial sesamoid. So as I'm looking here, the lateral sesamoid looks very nice. I'm not worried about that at all. The medial sesamoid does look a little bit scuffed, and so that I don't, I don't want her to have any plantar sesamoid pain because it's going to move up and down. So what we're going to do is we're actually going to take a piece of the collagen and wrap it around quickly so that I just want to put a nice surface underneath. Greg Berlay uh, out of Ohio had described what he called the boxing glove technique using a piece of um, uh, allograft uh, tissue. Um, we're going to kind of do that same technique. We're going to basically try to give us a new surface, or at least put a surface between the sesamoids and the plantar surface. Again, I only do this if, the, if there's any concern about damage. And so what I'll do is I'll just, I know my post, self-retainer, or actually just another sen. I know my sesamoids are sitting right under here. And so what I want to do is make sure that I get back to about here so that my, my boxing glove will come around. And I just am going to come, this is the most medial side of the metatarsal. Here's where my toe is. And so I just, I don't want to get into my tapered post, but I want to create a little bit of a hole yeah, from dorsal to plantar. And so you, first cortex, second cortex, and, and, and we're in. 
Let me just make sure I clean it out one more time because it makes it easier to pass this. Okay, so what I'm going to do now is um, with, that, with that hole created, I'm literally going to pass my um, needle through that hole we just created. And as she passes it through, what I'm going to do is really get underneath and try to find underneath. So if, if take this and pull down, and I come right in here and pull around, I can reach under, and I'm not feeling it. Actually, hold on. And I got it. So I reached under, and I grabbed my uh, a 205 wire. Now, you could drill another hole if you're at all worried. Um, the other thing you could do, like in her case, we could just use one of these old drill holes, which is right here, right next to it. Um, if you didn't want to, you could put them both through the same hole. But since I already have a drill hole right here, it's just a perfect place. We can just finish it up. So what I'll do is I'm going to take my drill. I'm going to use her old drill hole right here and just go through it, but to get to the other cortex. Now, this one is a lot harder than the first one to get into. And so you'll notice, what? It's gonna reach. Okay, and what I'm doing is I'm actually taking my thumb and I'm pushing the metatarsal over and I'm gonna reach underneath and see if I can't grab the needle. I can feel it and I'm gonna try to pull it out. Sometimes what I'll do is I'll even just come over from the medial side and pull underneath until I can feel it. And I can feel it, I'll grab it. So we passed it, we found it underneath, we pulled it through. Now remember, this was the lateral side. So what we'll do is I'll have to basically pull it across because I want it on this side of the metatarsal. Good, now we're on that side. So we actually have one on each side. We have sutra on each side. Now what we'll do is we're gonna take our piece of graft that we've been using already. There's our other graph just sitting there. And what we'll do real quick is cut it to a nice width to match our, our uh, plantar surface scissors. So I know about the width of my metatarsal. And I just want to kind of match that. I don't want a whole bunch of extra bulk in here. And I'm literally just going to cut this right along so that it matches. Now, what Lori will do is we are going to, the idea is we're going to wrap this thing right around the metatarsal head. So what she's going to take, we know both needles are, came out plantarly. So what we want to do is come from top to bottom on both of these. And it's just a nice little trick anytime you have sesamoid arthrosis. I've done this a, quite a number of times with pretty good success in, in eliminating some sesamoid arthrosis, even when I do a primary hemicap. Once, once I have it like that, then what we're gonna do is I'm gonna take the toe and I'm gonna plantar flex it as much as I can and you'll notice how the graft is just gonna slide right up underneath the metatarsal head as Loy pulls on it to create a boxing glove. So now I have a layer of soft, soft tissue between my um, sesamoids and my uh, graft. There's two between my sesamoids and my uh, plantar surface and my metatarsal head. Now, we want to make the finish up the boxing glove, so we're going to come back top to bottom again through the graft on each corner, each corner over here. Again, this is only part of the technique if you have sesamoid uh, arthritis or sesamoid pain. But you're going to do the same thing. Now that we have the needles passed through the graft, all we're going to do is tie both uh, the sutures, essentially creating a boxing glove around the metatarsal head. 
Now I understand that as she plantar flex, dorsiflex, flex, she's gonna tear this part of the uh, tissue off, that's okay. But I need some way to hold the graft in place while she begins early walking, because she's gonna walk on this tomorrow. I'm gonna make her walk and bend it. And I need some way of holding the graft, because if I just stuck it under there, it would just kind of slide everywhere as she's walking. This is a nice way to hold the graft in place um, plantarly while she's moving along. Understanding that eventually the graft over the metal will just be rubbed right off or eroded away. Um, and that. So now, basically, if you see this, we now have this toe, in my opinion, done. You can see that the extensor tendon is there. Again, I showed you the motion. Both grafts are sitting the way I want. The, uh, uh, if you look underneath, you can see the boxing glove going all the way underneath the metatarsal head. But now, you'll notice, when I move her, again, she dorsiflexes to 90 degrees and she plantar flexes, okay? And then to finish it off, um, and then at this point, once we're done, then basically we will just close this with a nice uh, running uh, stitch, uh, make it look very nice uh, and accommodative. I'll put a soft dressing on it. She'll get a post-op shoe, but she will be allowed to full weight bear tomorrow um, immediately because I don't want her to get stiff or uh, sore. And that'll be my post-operative course. You can see that we've recreated the head. We've kind of recreated a phalangeal base. And you can see the sesamoids are still sitting under there. And so I kind of like this. Yes, is the metatarsal a little short? We could have went a little bit longer, but I think she'll do fine because now she will be able, her sesamoids are there, but as she walks, she'll be able to move it. Now, if you look at a lateral x-ray, you can see the sesamoids sitting underneath the metatarsal head. Now, you can see, I'm going to try to rotate just slightly. Go ahead and get in the picture. Mostly so you can now see the sesamoids. Now, Junior, I, I want you to go on live fluoro. So as we go on live fluoro, you can actually watch the sesamoids are coming up and over, and they are moving along. I have not uh, 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 done anything to the sesamoid apparatus, and you can see that. You can also see 90 degrees of dorsiflexion. Thank you, turn that up. And so what we've been able to do is basically recreate the motion, keep the sesamoid apparatus underneath there, and recreate her joint for her. If I thought, or if I felt like I wanted to get her a little bit more uh, length to her metatarsal, uh, then um, I could come back, uh, I could unscrew the post a little bit and, and pull the head back out a little bit more. But I, I'm actually quite pleased with this because I actually have an x-ray of her other foot and she does have slightly shortened uh, metatarsals on both. Um, uh, and that's actually the procedure.